And good afternoon. Welcome back to Daring Live. It's uh, another wonderful Thursday and uh, really, really happy as always to be here. Um, David, how you doing? Doing well. All the way yeah. from Argentina. One more time, you're coming back home. You're coming back to the US uh, imminently, yeah, I think. <laughs> very cool. Well, I want to introduce this week's guest. We are very excited to welcome uh, this award-winning uh, quartet who hail from the heart of the Midlands in Ireland, a beautiful Ireland, uh, and bring us a unique blend of traditional Irish music uh, combined with bluegrass and Americana, which they have affectionately dubbed eyegrass, which I love. Uh, they bring a ton of energy to the live performances. If you haven't seen them, please make sure you do when, when we're able to. Um, but along with the virtualistic playing style and very sharp dress code, you might know them uh, to rival just about any bluegrass band. Uh, today we make, we welcome Jamie, Cajal, Dahi, and Gavin, collectively known as Jig Jam. Guys, how you doing? How's it going, lads? Thank you. All good. Very well. Thank you so, so much today for, for joining us. This is going to be a really fun one. Uh, we've, we've done a pretty extensive sound check. Everything sounds and looks great. Uh, it's about eight o'clock in the evening for you guys. It's noon over here in, uh, in San Diego. Um, but I think it would be really cool uh, to get things kicked off, as we always do, uh, with a little tune, if you guys are willing. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. All right. Let me edit this. All those German sounds Heard singing little turn around My head in the clouds And I'm not coming down Fantastic. Great to have you all here. Thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks a million. Yeah, it's great to um, be part of this. Um, 
we were very excited when we were asked first uh, because we follow the, the live streams, uh, all the Deering lives and such great artists that you've had involved over the last while and uh, it's great to be part of your, your lineup. So thanks very much. Yeah, we're happy you could make it. So tell us, tell everybody a little bit about the, uh, the history of the band, how the band got started and, and how did you kind of get and, and did the idea of, of blending bluegrass and, and Irish sounds, uh, was that part of the original plan or is that just something that kind of came organically after the band was formed and kind of started to be a part of it? Uh, yeah, so the band certainly didn't start the way it is now. Um, we started back in 2012, uh, nine years ago. We literally just started as what you'd regard as, I suppose, a a pub band or a band, you know, a covers band that would play in bars at the weekend. We were just doing it for a bit of fun uh, to make, do you know, a few, a few quid, <laughs> maybe a few <laughs> pints, uh, playing in the local bars around here in, in Tullamore. We were originally a five piece, uh, all locals. Uh, it was myself, Dahi, Cottle, uh, James, Guy who played the accordion, and my sister Kira who played the fiddle. And like I said, we were doing mainly just covers of whatever the pop songs were at the time along with ACDC and Bruce Springsteen and <laughs> whatever the crowd wanted. So I suppose it was only after, um, you know, with the band started getting busier and James and Kira unfortunately couldn't commit with work commitments. So myself, Dahi and Kahu kept going with the band, but it's only then when we discovered the, I suppose, our love for bluegrass music. Our roots was always, were always in uh, Irish traditional music. We grew up playing that stuff. But uh, the fact that he played the five string was probably the introduction of the bluegrass side of things. And sure, naturally enough, when you tracked uh, both genres of music, there is such such a tight connection between both. Uh, so I think it was a natural thing to do to fuse both together and, and see where it went from there. So that's how that started. And after a year, uh, Gavin here joined the band and we've been a four piece for five years, maybe more. And it's pretty much since then we have been playing this style of music. Now it has developed, obviously, over the last few years as the live shows go on and as different audiences we come across. You know, we have made little changes here and there, but that's probably where it started and how it's become what it is today. And what's kind of when you play, like, because there's a lot of fiddle tunes that, that are, you know, are played in the bluegrass style that are come from the from the Irish background. Um, is there a way that you approach a tune like that um, differently be, than just playing in a traditional straight Irish feel to kind of give it a little bit of a bluegrass feel? Let's say if you're playing something like Blackberry Blossom that's you know commonly played in the, in the bluegrass circles, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah even uh, well, a lot of the times we... Uh, we put sets together of tunes and we could have a, an Irish tune and a bluegrass tune together. And sometimes we, we would uh, we would play the bluegrass tune in unison together, uh, which is kind of a traditional Irish way of playing them. And then sometimes we'd uh, improvise on maybe a traditional Irish tune and kind of mix and match that kind of way. And then also featuring the, the tenor banjo on a few of the, the bluegrass tunes and trying to play a few Irish tunes on the five string as well. So. And did all of you all, do all of you all have backgrounds of listening to bluegrass as well? Or was, was that mainly you, Dahi, and then, and then you, you all kind of started, started, you know, listening to it more after you started playing it some? Yeah, um, I, I certainly didn't anyway. It was mainly Dahi and Cahill had um, just, I suppose some form of background in bluegrass. Uh, I certainly didn't, and Gavin was probably more like me. We were just mainly Irish traditional players. Um, I would have played a bit of other genres, but I didn't know much about bluegrass only until Jig Jam started playing it itself. So we're very much still kind of learning the ropes of bluegrass, uh, even though we are dubbed as sometimes, you know, a bluegrass band. Uh, it's still, you know, very new to us. We're still listening to old Tony Rice records and trying to figure out what they're doing and <laughs> chancing our arm and trying to play along. And um, 
it's a learning process for us constantly, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very enjoyable. And like that, we rarely have gone on and announced ourselves as a bluegrass band out and out because we know we're not. We're uh, definitely a hybrid, a fusion band. And I think that's the thing that works for us is the fact that we have the Irish mix there and the Irish background, because that's what we know, I suppose. Bluegrass is new to us, so we're just trying our best to find a happy medium between both, really. Right. And, and Jamie, you play the tenor banjo as well, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, we're, um, we're kind of a, a backwards band in many ways. The tenor banjo would, would have been originally my first instrument that I would have always played as a young lad, and the guitar would have been my second instrument. But yeah, I'm playing the guitar in the band. Gavin would also fit into that, uh, that description. Gavin would be primarily a tenor banjo player growing up, but yet he would predominantly play mandolin in the band. Dahi started playing the guitar as a young fella, <laughs> and now he's playing the five-string banjo in the band. And Cahill over there is a predominantly a fiddle player growing up, but now he's playing the double bass mainly in the band. So, <laughs> we're really yeah, we're confused. We're still <laughs> trying to find yourself still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dai, why did you pick up the five-string banjo um, growing up? Yeah, what drew okay. you to that instead of the tenor? Uh, I, I grew up playing guitar, like Jamie said, and uh, I got heavy into kind of fingerstyle playing guitar and uh, listened to a lot of fellas like uh, Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed. And uh, listened to Jerry Reed stuff. He had a banjo in the band I could hear. And uh, I fell in love with that sound. But also, Cottle, uh, we went to school together. And his, uh, his dad is into bluegrass. And anytime I go over to the house, he'd be showing us bluegrass videos as well. And uh, that kind of seeped in as well. And then just uh, seeing videos of Earl Scruggs and Bella Fleck on YouTube and getting my mind blown. And uh, I just said, yeah, that's something that I'd like to do. So and how, how'd you learn um did did you did you have a teacher or did you use videos or books or because yeah, you've come a mainly, long way you're a great player so it's mainly <laughs> self-taught i got the the other scrubs uh, five-string banjo book right the start. I learned a lot from that and then uh yeah i'm, I'm still still trying to learn it <laughs> And did you go? Did you start using it, sitting in on Irish sessions, and, yeah. and learning fiddle tune, learning Irish tunes on the five string? Exactly, yeah. Because even growing up, that was a big part of uh, when I met Cottle. Uh, we used to go to sessions, and I'd back up him on the fiddle with the guitar, and then I start bringing the five string to sessions as well, and chance my arm on a few Irish tunes. And do you think that? Look, having such a background in playing in playing Irish tunes on the five string, does that help your single string playing? Because you do quite a lot of single string um, runs and, and licks. A absolutely, yeah. And it, even just uh, figuring out Irish tunes, it's definitely the way to go is single string style. It's probably what I do when I'm just figuring out a tune. But I definitely try to uh, incorporate the rolls and using the fifth string as much as I can. Uh, the fire string is so unique, so I just try to use everything that it can there to uh, to showcase the the fire string and play the the Irish tunes. And um, but yeah, they can be definitely tricky uh, on the fire string. They're not kind of laid out very well because the fire string isn't very linear uh, as it is the the tenor or the the mandolin. But uh, kind of find a ways around it. But yeah, mostly kind of single string stuff and. Uh, <laughs> The triplets and stuff like that adding them in so we could even play it if you want to play yep. bluegrass and irish do you want to try that yeah uh, that'd be fantastic yeah yeah might, uh, yep. might come across better than me trying to explain <laughs> it um like two rounds of whiskey for breakfast and play it together now like yeah even uncle set. uncle Derek. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah yeah sure This is what bluegrass tune to Irish tune. Yeah, it's a uh, whiskey before breakfast to start. Um, then it goes into uh, an Irish reel called Mother's Delight and finishes with one of your ones, is yeah. it? One of Gavin's originals. What's it called? John Guinan's reel. John Guinan's. There you are. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, it incorporates, like Dahi was saying, uh, everything doing stuff that's not supposed to, five string playing, Irish tunes, tenor playing, bluegrass tunes, and then mixing it together. So look at you, see for yourselves what's about. <laughs> yeah. Don't like, just don't see don't turn us off just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. 
Um, I mean, it's 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 great hearing the two banjos together complementing each other and not just like you know just getting in each other's way or just playing on top of each other. How do you how do you how do you kind of approach that? <laughs> do, do you all have a trick of, of do you have any how, how would how would you suggest people doing that if they're playing with two banjos or you know a tenor and a five string together? Is there any? Yeah, um, I suppose even just as Dottie was saying about arranging it um like if you're going to try to play a bluegrass tune on, on the tenor i suppose working out the, the you're matching matching your chords i suppose is the first thing you want to get that right and i suppose with the bluegrass tune that you're taking turns um playing the tune the solo one and um even then if you're, if you're playing an irish tune you might try maybe improvising it as well yeah it's even even the fact that uh the tenor, even on that second show in Mother's like the tenor is like the oct octave down yeah. from the... Yeah. So the tenor is the octave down there. So if we're just playing in unison kind of or octave apart, and then on the second part of the tune, I'm just doing the harmony to it. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of keeps each other out of each other's way in some part and and then at the last tune i'm just kind of uh, trying to follow jamie and just kind of lock into that and kind of stay out with the lads way as well you see i suppose the tenor can always always go mandolin style if needed as well and be a backing instrument with a chuck which is something uh -huh. that too so i suppose not just using the tenor as a a melody instrument that we you know try and incorporate rhythm as well yeah. so yeah. that you can and likewise with the yeah. instrument yeah, I suppose just trying to get the full capabilities of each instrument to use it as a complement as well as a melody instrument. Um, right. So, Dahi, you're doing sometimes you'll you'll fall back and do some some backup style roll patterns. Um, Definitely, yeah, yeah, and, and even just the standard uh -huh. uh, choking behind as well. But yeah, the rolls yep. are nice to add in that kind of driving thing behind the tenor as well. Nice. And. Um, Let's see, we have a question in the chat from Bobby Stockstead. He's asking, how do you approach playing Irish triplets on a five string? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, had like, I, I started uh, doing online lessons um, at the start of this year. Uh, that's a shameless quote there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I had some people who come to me for a few Irish tunes and stuff like that. And that's what they're wondering as well, different ways of doing the triplets. And uh, yeah, you have the basic way, uh, and it's basically just like a forward roll, so tongue, index, middle. And it's easiest to just start on the first string, on the D string, and just... And that, that's, and you can just repeat that. It just failed. And then you can move that to the inside strings. It can be difficult to kind of get all the fingers in there on, on the in-between strings, so on the B and the G. And sometimes uh, a better triplet for that can be a, a tongue index tongue. And there's a nice kind of pop off that, so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways and uh, it, it really depends uh, on where you're putting it in the tune and uh trying and that's the main problem as well is fi figuring out the irish tunes of just getting the right hand to line up properly and uh and a lot of time after the, the triplets the kind of emphasis is on the the note after it if that makes sense so <laughs> So if you're trying to get that kind of feel into it, you can just accent that note straight after the triplet with your tongue. And then if you're doing that with the uh, tongue index tongue, you can do it. So the, the emphasis is nearly on the note after the triplet. And that's where the kind okay. of feel comes from. That's good. And what if you're doing two triplets in a row, you know, not with not with a triplet and then and then a, like a quarter note, but if you're going, you know, yeah, da -da 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 -da. Uh, yeah. So that's similar to something we play in the set and, and that'll be just uh, straightforward rolls. That's what I use anyway. 
Gotcha. Keeping the forward, uh, and that's the best thing about the forward roll. You can you can do it fairly quick. Uh, so I think some people use triplets going backwards, so middle index tone, but it's harder to get the speed up on that. I find that. Yeah. And where do you put your right hand when you're playing a, a, a melody? Do you in the in the Irish style? Do you are you moving up towards the logo? Part of the head, or are you are you keeping it back towards the bridge, like you would in kind of a bl t bright bluegrass sort of spot? Yeah, it really depends uh, whereabouts in the tune it is. Uh, definitely for a mellower sound down here, um, closer to the neck. Um, for that kind of stuff, for more driving kind of stuff. Uh, there's a tune that we play, Flowers of Red Hill, and we try to get the kind of bluegrass feel into that with the five string, uh, and try to get the rolls in there. So ra rather playing the Irish tune, kind of single string style, uh, like the tenor, it was more of a Scruggs kind of thing. So that was definitely more towards the bridge. Uh, so it was a... Tune, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. We have another question in the chat um, from Kelly, and she's curious if the five string was accepted at trad um, Irish sessions or if you got worried looks. No, he wasn't never accepted. <laughs> uh, never accepted, yeah. Tenor's barely accepted. <laughs> <laughs> So people people don't like people don't like the banjo much in in the in the traditional sessions it, even. Uh, it's uh, subject to a hard time a lot of time. But just banjo jokes usually get thrown around. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. It's well, rarely seen with a five string in sessions. Right? That's the thing, and a lot of time, if it was in the session, it'd be more for backing up the, the singer or something like that. The, mm -hmm. Like the likes of Luke Kelly played five string, and so himself and Barney McKenna there were the first to have the tenor and the yeah. five string going. <laughs> and the, the likes of Finbar Fury and Tommy Makeham and all them fellas did at the five string as well. So it was good for that Irish kind of folk scene back in the day. Kind of a Pete Seeger kind of take to a lot of kind of play. Right. And and Gavin, what how you know playing mandolin as well? How do you compare the difference between playing mandolin and tenor? I'm assuming you're using. The, on the tenor using GDAE tuning, um, No, I actually, on the banjo, I, the, the G, I tune it to an A. Um, oh, it's, okay. It's become quite popular um, in tenor banjo players the last couple of years. Um, I picked it up from Mendes Gahill. Would you, you, Jamie would use it yes, as well. Um, yeah. 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 I think he it mentioned it the, other, the yeah. other day on Deering Live too. So I think it came from like Scottish fiddle playing, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, but look, it and then, but I would have played GDA growing up, like, and I obviously played a mandolin, um, in that GDA tune as well. But, um, I'd find them very different instruments now, I suppose. Um, I suppose the more I learn about bluegrass as well, like the mandolin and the tenor banjo are quite different. But then again, like in fiddle tune wise, it's the same finger and that. So there's a lot of similarities as well. So it's a bit of both, really. And, what would you say there's a, a lot of mandolin players that haven't played the tenor banjo and i'm always i'm always surprised that they don't know more about it where do you, do you can you use a lot of your mandolin licks on the on the tenor banjo oh definitely yeah um yeah you, you can definitely transfer a lot of that i think probably if you're transferring over onto the tenor is just it, well, especially when you're in Irish music, you're just supposed to just listen to, to tunes and just try and start learning a few Irish uh, session tunes. Because even you, you'd notice there's a big crossover, even from traditional um, fiddle tunes and Irish tunes. There, there's a massive crossover there anyway. So, yeah, I think if there's any mandolin players out there thinking about a tenor banjo, they, they could definitely give it a shot. And I'd say you have to scratch in no time. Cool. And what to, for, um, what's the standard... For the Irish tenor, you kind of see a lot of different setups. What do you think is the most common? Is that the 19 fret 
or the seven versus of the 17 fret and then also resonator versus open back in uh, yeah. ten years. um i think probably the 19 fret would probably use and uh having a resonator as well just for the, for the volume that's what I, I would think anyway generally speaking most people would play that i uh, um, rarely see open backs yeah although ender has a kind of a hybrid he used a hybrid over the years that well i think it was mainly to take the weight out of it um he had a kind of a half and open it was still closed at some degree but most tenor banjos would you have a resonator on it yeah yeah and the uh, arch top sort of skin would be popular as well even though i know gavin doesn't have it on his but a lot of the tenors would have that arch top uh, body as well you know mm -hmm. the arch top tone ring yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So I, I have an arch top in mind now it's an old epiphone but say gavin wouldn't have but you'd see you would see a lot of arch tops, yeah 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 um like i think originally for the tenor was it, it was needed for its sound like and its volume like playing the dance halls in New York back in the 1920s, so they would have needed volume. So a lot of people, yeah, they go for the the 19 fret and the, the resonator, and I think it just kind of carried on to today. And, and most people, you think, would you'd say like to have a tone ring in in their when playing Irish tenor, and also do they what kind of head do they use? Because I see a lot of people using fiber skin heads or Renaissance heads, or um, it kind of moving around a lot. Uh, yeah, I think generally people would want a tone ring. And then uh, the head, I suppose, is kind of personal. You see a lot of different types of heads in it, really, wouldn't you? Like, mm. um, some people would have to, it could be frosted, but generally. They're usually, the, um, same as what you'd have yeah. for a tenor and the yeah. five string would usually be frosted, wouldn't it? Mm. Mm. Like, well, what yeah. we come across anyway. Yeah. Tenor seems to be that. Yeah, well, I, mine was originally frosted. Oh, was it? Right? Out, yeah. Such, yeah, I'd be the yeah. same. I would yeah. I'd prefer. With that this side. Yeah. yeah. Is that Renaissance head? I'm showing my ignorance here now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what kind of frosty ones? <laughs> 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 yeah. The one with um, the scratchy stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. It's kind of smooth. <laughs> yeah, the smooth one. <laughs> what kind of pick do you use? Do you use a real heavy pick or do you use a lighter pick? No, I suppose that's the biggest difference for me with the mandolin and the banjo. For like a tenor banjo, I'd use a like a Jim Dunlop 50 mil pick. Um, like I would never really use a heavy one with the tenor, um, but with a mandolin, then I'd use a heavy one, like a, a blue chip or a wegan. Um, but yeah, I just, I tried out the ban tenor banjo and just for tune playing, it just, it was too heavy for me anyway. So G Jim Dunlop was the man there now for the tenor banjo. And he, that'd be the, a fairly popular choice of plectrum for tenor banjo players in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You like the lighter pick on, on tenor banjo because you can, does it help you play the triplets easier? Yeah, that, that's the main thing really with the triplets. Like, um, again, you couldn't go super light because for me now, anyway, it's a 50 mil uh, Dunlap, Dunlap Tortex pick I find great. But the Jim Dunlap Nylons are great as well. And again, yeah, mainly it's the triplets you're taking into account. Um, you just, pop, pop off. It yeah, it's going to get a nice kind of a yeah, pop off of it. They're a very personal kind of a thing, um, plectrums, like people go through phases with them and lucky enough, most of them are cheap enough so you can you can try out different ones. But um, yeah, I've been using these uh, these ones now for a while. And, uh, I'm happy enough with them now. Well, do you all want to play another tune? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Red Paddy? Red Paddy? Yeah, I'm sure you're welcome. Yeah, whatever you take.
Fantastic. Um, we have a question from from Larry um, Mack, I think it is. Um, he's wondering, do, do you all write your own music? Yeah, we do indeed, yeah. Um, yeah, we have our own songs, our own tunes. Um, obviously, we mix our own stuff in with a lot of the old traditional stuff as well. But the first song we played, Hello World, was an original song. Um, one of the last tunes in the second set was a tune that Gavin wrote. So I suppose we would have a, a mixture, yeah. be probably half and half when it comes to a live show of originals, you know, against um, traditional songs. And then a few random covers always thrown into to live gigs as well. So. And is the old right tunes... Is there a songwriting process where you all write together, or do you generally one person brings something in and then everybody learns it? In the past, I think it's mainly been guys bring their own thing to the table. Um, like we haven't, like we have done stuff where we all sat down, but it's usually done individually or even in in, in twos, you know. Um, but that seems to be a trend so far. But that's not saying that we could write our next song all together as a four but um it does vary but so far it has been kind of every man brings their own thing to the table really and getting back to the, the banjos um jamie yours is yours is an open back right oh no, it's a, there's a resonator on it oh okay okay it's an old, it's an old banjo though, so it's it looks it is smaller actually yeah um it's an old epiphone uh, b recording so it's nearing its 100th birthday now in, in a couple of years. Wow. It'll be antique. And what, uh, look, why don't we go around and what's, Gavin, what tenor banjo do you have? What model are you playing? Uh, it's the Deering Calico. Um, yeah, so I have, it about, yeah, I have it about 15 years now. And um, yeah, I'm delighted with it. It's, it's going to serve me well so far anyway. <laughs> and Dai, what what's the model five string you have? Yeah, I have the Deering uh, Golden Era. Um, so yeah, it's great. I love it. Sorry to leave you out of the conversation, Carl. Uh, <laughs> you can tell us about your fiddle if you <laughs> like. <laughs> also a Deering. Um. Let's, you all have kind of you, an instrumentation where you, I know, Kyle, you, you're playing the bass a lot these days, but often you're not playing the bass. And it's a very similar instrumentation to uh, We Banjo 3, who we had on a little bit back. And Jamie, I noticed your pickup on your guitar when you're playing guitar is turned. Uh, oh, yeah, I do. Um, is that something you picked up from David Howley? Because I know he does that too. Um, it's something that. Uh, I think the first guy in Irish music was uh, Mike. What's oh, his, you know the film Brave Dan Break and Trad. He yeah. was in more recently. Yeah, yeah. They say Mike Alvin. Mike, Mike Alvin. Alvin. Yeah, yeah. So they say he was the first guy to do it. Uh, but I would have talked to David Howley about it before, and uh, I definitely remember having the conversation with Dave after hearing their live shows to, I suppose, ask him how he has his setup. Now the only thing is. Dave plays Dag Dad, which would be a lot more common for Irish backing, whereas I play standard tuning, which I find is uh, a lot more uncommon, really. So I probably had to alter mine a little bit different because of the tuning. Um, the Dag Dad, I suppose, always has that bass string covered with something, but uh, standard is not always the case. So I have to, I'm trying to get an equal balance between my. E and A string. So when I still hit an open string, I can still use the bass effect. But like um, Dave and like all the other guys, uh, it's running through an octave pedal and it's a great addition to a live show when we don't have the bass. But um, yeah, that's that's it. And then there's a normal pickup uh, under the saddle there as well. To do it so use the, the octave pedal to get the, the extra boost on the low end. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it works a treat for, for live gigs, really. Yeah, it's great not to lose that low end when I go on fiddle. Yeah. 
Definitely. And then uh, Dai and Gavin, y'all are plugging in uh, your banjos. What pickups are y'all using? Use a Fishman pickup, um, uh, and then for a preamp, we use a LR bags. Um, simple enough setup, but um, yeah, it's happy enough with the sound from it. Yeah, yeah. Which bags? Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I used the LR bags venue DI. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And the same for you, Dai? Yeah, same Fishman uh, bluegrass or rare earth pickup. Seems to do the trick as well. And the, you also have a lot of pedals, we noticed, um, looking at like some of your videos, some of your live videos. What are what are y'all running through besides just the, the DI? Yeah, we, we haven't seen our pedals now in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, uh, I had a wah wah online, a wah wah pedal. Oh, for a while. Uh, it was a bit temperamental with the banjo, uh, two squeals and stuff like that, but kind of added to the show, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and other than that, it's kind of, it's not too many effects that, uh, maybe a bit of course or a bit of delay, a small bit. That's about it, really. You need to get a bit more experimental. <laughs> yeah. Um, and going back to the tenor banjo, when y'all were learning tenor banjo, was there, do you remember any kind of, what were some of the hard spots that, that you tried to had to kind of overcome any of those big, you know, you kind of learn and hit these plateaus. What what were they and, and how'd you kind of overcome them? Um, I'd say the biggest obstacle nearly every tenor bench player has when they're learning is the picking pattern. So like you should be picking down, up, down, down, up, down. Generally, uh, and the scale is pretty much <laughs> written a few books uh, talking about it. Um, it's the main thing that will stop you from you know, missing triplets or even playing fast or getting a smooth uh, tempo is if you're if you're picking up if you have too many downstrokes or too many upstrokes it's going to interrupt your playing so um that'd be one thing that you have to, it can be a bit tedious but there's a couple of exercises and um if you like good, good teachers can kind of help you overcome it so i say that'd be the first thing that springs to mind for me anyway yeah yeah um just overall flow to tunes i know it's Again, it reverts back to the picking pattern. Uh, but like the banjo being a very staccato instrument, sometimes people struggle with making it sound like the tune is flowing and yeah. it can sound a little bit disjointed. Yeah. And I know certainly that's what usually would um, differentiate players um, back when you're younger and you're trying to aspire to be, who, do you know, whether it's Enda Scattle or Jerry O'Connor or whoever, and you're playing away and you can't quite get the same flow as, as they're getting. And it is down to the stuff like picking pattern. But um, just, I think that's an Irish music thing as well. Um, no matter what instrument you're on to try and get a, a decent rhythm going that makes the tune flow nicely. But it's just particularly hard on the banjo being such a disjointed yeah. and staccato yeah. instrument. Is there... Do you, do you practice a lot with a metronome and do you kind of focus on having a relaxed feel to kind of get rid of that that um, disjointed sort of sound? Um, the metronome for me anyway is definitely a, a newer thing in recent years. Like growing up playing Irish music, I didn't use it much, just would have played with, with other people, but I definitely find it a useful tool now, all right, to if I'm trying to learn something or get something up to speed or if there's a difficult passage, it's, it's good to run it through uh, your paces with a metronome. Um, it's definitely a very useful tool, right? Yeah. Well, as Gavin well, said, though, that's in recent years, it was yeah, like growing up. Like to be honest, like before the pandemic, I'd say as a band, we never used it. No, we never used the metronome once in our life, on, only for when it's in the studio. And that's I know that sounds crazy, but it's just being honest. And that's why I suppose when we do come across timing issues or we listen back to a, a live show and say you know we were speeding up or slowing down there i think it's it took us a while to, to to hit us in the face like it's something we should have definitely been doing a long time ago but i think yes that's absolutely how you get your timing better and tighter but to be yeah to, to call it as it is no we wouldn't have looked at one until probably last year the year before you know and a lot of 
three of y'all went to music school. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Most of them, but we each other, yeah. and like second level. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah. Like shout there, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. I studied music in college, right? And even uh, I was lucky enough to study like tenor banjo, uh, Kieran Hanran. Um. He played with Stocks and Swing and a couple of great bands, but he was a great teacher as well. And I think Jamie actually had him when he was younger with Kieran. And yeah, I went to him privately. He was a uh, he was great. He just was very um he was a very uh, constructive and kind of a he was a critical listener, but he was quite constructive. And his advice definitely helped me a lot. Um, even with stuff like I was like the picker pattern and stuff is stuff that I was still working on when I was in like say university studying study music. So it's definitely a lifelong thing. Um. But yeah, I, I studied like a Bachelor of Music in um, in Dublin and a little specialised in Irish traditional music performance. But um, and I was living with other, another banjo player there as well. So that even being amongst your peers there, that was great. Like, and it was probably then that I even got just got turned on to music outside of Irish music. I was just turned on to Bela Fleck and the Fleck Toms, and I suppose that's how I kind of started discovering the whole other world of uh, banjo and bluegrass and world music in general so yeah it was definitely a great experience yeah. and, and da, da you studied contemporary music in, in music school yeah that, right? that was the name of it all right um <laughs> yeah it was in uh, dublin I, I went there for two years it was just a two-year course and uh i wasn't playing i played banjo there a small bit but i went in as a guitar player so it, it wasn't really a uh, traditional music but it was more focused on yeah contemporary kind of stuff uh, some rock, uh, blues, and, and jazz, just scraping the surface of those kind of genres. But uh, the, when I did mention that I played banjo, uh, there's great players there and some great bands that were put together that I played banjo for up there then as well, which was it was great fun. I got to meet a lot of people up there and learned a lot as well. So yeah. And how have you brought all that knowledge of of, of playing guitar and playing playing you know different genres on guitar and um, and, and bringing that to the five string banjo. Yeah, it definitely helped in the single string playing because that's very guitar y kind of uh, mm -hmm. around stuff. And I was playing finger style guitar mainly. So when I'm playing guitar, I usually, usually use a, a tone pick. So I was doing a lot of, uh, I got into a lot of country kind of guitar players and stuff like that, and chicken picking and uh, cherry reeds and stuff like that. So when I tra transitioned to the, to the banjo, it wasn't too much of a change. Um, but yeah, I definitely have some guitar ideas that I uh, flow over to the banjo now and again. And then recently learning some Tony Rice licks and trying to play them on the banjo and stuff like that as well. Well, do you all want to play another tune while we have you? Yeah. Yeah.
else than we have, I'm afraid. <laughs> Just wow. Just I, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of people in the chat that, that have seen you guys live. Uh, and they're kind of commenting on it, which is really cool. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's several that haven't. Uh, and this is awesome, but it just does not do it justice to win. Like, we are in front of you guys uh, on stage, uh, which is just rad. I've had the pleasure of seeing you a couple of times, both on an actual stage and then, like, very intimately, like, in our booth at IBM May. I want to say it was 2019, 2018, maybe? Or 2018, and you guys, you guys spent the, the whole day just kind of walking around, and every every kind of hour or so, you just kind of wander in and pick up a couple of banjos and just jam yeah. for like 20. It was great. It was really cool. But it's just you get a sense of just how tight you guys are. It's it's, it's insane. But um, I want to jump in, and just ask a, a couple couple of questions here, and then there's, there's a couple from the the chat as well. I noticed you guys have your own record label, right? Uh, no, it's just. Uh... Or is it just a, is it like a platform for you guys? It comes up on Google as that, but uh, ah. it's it independent. But it says Jig Jam Records, which sounds very impressive. I suppose <laughs> <to do it. laughs> well, I was just going to ask: is it, is it something that maybe that you have spoken about that may, you want to establish uh, and maybe like expand on uh, in the future? Because it's it's I mean it's a great opportunity for people to release music independently, right? Yeah, um, I look at it's the. It's the thing that bands find very difficult these days, knowing whether they should actually sign with a record label or they should go independently because it's not really like the the old days where you know it was all about right or all about signing a, a a record deal. Like there's pros and cons to both sides, but now which is something that we have weighed up in the past. And for now, we find it's more beneficial for us to stay independent. But who knows what'll happen in the future, you know? Seems like there's room for growth there. You heard it here first, everybody. I like it. Um, all right, so Bobby, uh, who asked a question earlier on, but he had another one. Um, do you guys do much teaching yourselves? Yeah, yeah, I've been teaching online now uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, it's been great, crack. Meeting a lot of new people. Meeting a lot of people, five-string players in Ireland here that are picking it up now as well. Some great players, so... Yeah, and teaching some Irish tunes as well online. So been really enjoying that this year. That's awesome. Is it is can can people find you for lessons anywhere? Um or uh, yeah, it's just dahi banjo at gmail.com. Just yeah, very cool. Right. Or you can drop drop us a message, Jig Jammer. Find me on social media or we'll get you. Like and we, we posted up the, the, the website as well. well. We'll get that up before the end of the show here as well. Um, Joseph Brusk, who's a uh, avid listener and, and viewer of Daring Live, he's been with us pretty much from the start. But he says, according to legend, uh, bluegrass comes from Scott Irish immigrants. Do you find any popular Irish melodies in bluegrass songs? That's a good question. Yeah, lot, lots and lots. Um, I think that's where we've found our niche and that's I suppose why we've chosen to to pop ourselves in the middle of both genres because all those old school like old timey tunes and songs and uh, yeah, sort of mountain music and bluegrass music that all originated from Irish and Celtic immigrants so we do hear the melodies all the time and look at some of the examples we even played today, like Whiskey Before Breakfast is an example of a yeah. tune that is deemed an Irish tune and a bluegrass tune. If you wanted to look at the, the Red Haired Boy is another bluegrass tune, but it's also an Irish tune called, um, oh, what, Tea Totter, is it? Uh, no, that's not. Jolly Beggar. Jolly, Jolly Beggar, Beggar, sorry. Yeah. Mm. Same melody. And the Temperance. And the Temperance really yeah. is a Tea Totter. Yeah. Same melody is just played in a different style. With slightly different instrumentation, but uh, yeah, it, ha it happens all the time with us. And when we, when we do hear it, we'd say we'd all just consider it bringing yeah. it into the into the set. Yeah, same with a lot of the songs. There's a, a great documentary. I think it's called Bringing It Back. Have you seen that? Uh, the Clancy Brothers are on it as well, and they're talking about those old, old Irish folk songs that came over to America those years ago. It's a great one. If anyone wants to look it up. What What did you say that was called? I think it's called bringing it back. Bringing it back. Yeah. Nice. I'll check that out as well. That, that sounds good. That I mean, it's all one of the great things about the music that you know <clears throat> we talk about here on on Daring Live, whether it's bluegrass or old time or 
Appalachian or, or even Irish, you know, there's so much history there. You know, there's so much, so many different stories, and it's just it's it's fascinating. Um, that's awesome. Uh, I, I don't have too many other questions. There's a few people curious as to whether that's uh, Kyle's dog in the background. Um, no, not there. Couldn't hear him. <laughs> I, I think that, I think there's a dog barking outside here. Oh, is that you there? Okay. And Pat. <laughs> Pat says it's called bringing it back home. I think. There we go. Very cool, guys. I think that's a, that's a really good. Uh, Endpoint. We're at the top of the hour. It has been a pleasure. Um, do you have? I mean, Kyle's been pretty quiet there in the corner. Do you have any closing thoughts there? You got. You got to get involved. I love banjos. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. A lot. Uh, <laughs> what, what's next for you guys? We spoke off, off you know, backstage right before we started, but um, I know you're you're planning to come out to the U.S. Uh, here in a little bit, and it, you know, again, like, things are really starting to open up here and I think mostly around the world. What does the rest of the year hold for, for Jig Jam? Yeah, lot, lots of touring as um, July hits in August. Uh, like obviously with the pandemic, it was in the dark for a while, but the States have got things going again and we have about 12 weeks of, of shows and festivals lined up. We're starting down in Woodstock, Georgia on the 31st of July. And we're moving our way around um, some Irish festivals, bluegrass festivals, folk festivals. I know Winfield is one we'll probably see some of you guys there yep. in Kansas. Um, the Milwaukee Irish Fest is another one. Sisters Folk Fest in Oregon. Oh, good. It's a few, but they're all going to be posted on our website really soon, you know, as they're all announced. So, you know, And you can check out the guys at jigjam.com ie for more information on that and are, are you doing any touring kind of in, in the uk like in, in your home country as it were or is it mainly us based for the rest of the year uh we have uk tour next year in 22 uh we've nothing at home here in ireland for nothing in stone yet but uh obviously we always try to do a nice tour here in ireland every year so awesome. um between that and then yeah a couple of european things that it's nice awesome. to come back this way. And everything's going to be posted on your website so people can double check and, and see what's up. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Before we go, this is your your channel. You're on all of the major socials except TikTok is what you said. Yeah. So you can, you can be found on there. And, and presumably, uh, all of your music is, is available on all the major platforms for download uh, and from the site as well. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to you want to talk about? Is there anything else you want to plug away before we head out? No, we this is your chance. <laughs> thank you guys uh, once more. Uh, we're obviously since we came across the Deering the Deering brand first as an instrument, we fell in love with the instruments, and then uh, when we first came across the Deerings themselves a couple of years ago and saw what the whole thing is about, you know, we've always just been so interested and we just enjoy meeting you guys along the way and we just want to thank you again for asking us to do this like i said part of such a incredible lineup of bands and musicians and players for us to be you know said in the same sentence as some of those bands is, is very uh humbling to us so we'd like to thank you guys for for having us on yeah, oh it's it's an absolute pleasure and and thank you for being here thank you for for the great setup it sounded great uh, or throughout the whole show, that makes a huge difference. Um, and yeah, like you, for us, you know, our customers are, are everything, but our, our artists are everything, you know. And, and we help, we thank you for, for playing the banjos and spreading the love and, and anything we can do together in the future. Like, just let's just keep talking, let's have some fun. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll see you in, uh, in the UK or out on these shores. And like I said, backstage, if you're in LA or make it down to San Diego, just let us know. Even in New Orleans, they will, they will greet you in New Orleans when he gets back. So, uh, We'll, we'll be we'll have to hang out or something absolutely yeah sounds all good. right all right it would be wrong of me not to ask if you want to play us out yeah, yeah. i get the sense that you kind of love playing so let's let's, yeah, let's yeah. see what we can do <laughs> we'll finish off with uh, one of our own uh, about our hometown tullamore and it's homegrown whiskey tullamore june so awesome here we go well, while you're tuning up, just say, everybody, thank you so, so much for tuning in again this week. Uh, keep your eyes posted on your emails, and we'll let you know what the next episode is. Uh, David, thank you as always. Uh, Jonathan, our producer in training in the background. Let's say hi to Jonathan real quick. Hi, Jonathan. 
What's going on? <laughs> Put him on the spot. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so, so much. I appreciate it. And uh, everybody be safe. And let's uh, have one more tune. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Where the head of crones in the house Ain't the man in tiny millions He brought magic to King's County And he bottled it right there He brought a drink for me and a drink for you A faithful some or two Many barrels he can deliver